Hey, it's Jared. This is the Synology 923 Plus NAS, and I'm going to be using it as a backup for my desktop storage. Now, a few months ago, I put a two-bay Synology NAS on my desk as an expansion storage option for my MacBook Pro. My MacBook Pro has four terabytes of internal storage, but I was constantly running into issues with running out of space when editing a lot of big video projects like my YouTube videos. And so I added a two-bay Synology NAS, which gave me 16 terabytes of storage on my desktop, which is fantastic. But one of the benefits of a NAS is running in a RAID arrangement with your drives, which means typically you get some sort of protection against drive failure. Now, if I had done that on the two bay NAS, I would have limited the amount of storage space that I can have on that NAS because one of those drives would have simply just had to be a copy of the other drive that's in there so that if one drive goes bad, I could pull the other one out. Now, I wanted maximum performance for the NAS that's on my desktop, and so that's how I configured that Synology NAS. But that means that I don't have any sort of a backup for those drives. Should something happen to one of those drives, it would take out the data on both of those drives, which is unfortunate. So I have a four bay NAS here that is going to work as a backup for my desktop NAS. And I could put this anywhere in my office and the Synology software is going to back up my two bay NAS to the four bay NAS. And then of course this box having more expansion opportunities, I could use it for other purposes as well if I put enough storage in it. But my main goal here is to have a backup of my desktop storage and that's what the 923 plus is gonna be for. First on the front here, we've got four doors in which we will pull out the caddies and install the drives. We've got our status LEDs right here, which will show whether the device is powered on, reading and writing, and the status of all the drives. We have a USB type A right on the front, which means we can plug USB devices directly into the front of this device and offload data onto the NAS, which is a great feature. On the back side of the device, we've got two big fans for cooling, which is great. We've got two ethernet ports. We've got a eSATA port here as well. And this is where our power goes in. We also have a USB type A on the back. And then we have a port here, which we can add faster ethernet. So if we wanted to add a faster ethernet card, we could do that and it would give us faster read and write speeds. And we will be adding one of those. I have uh, the T1 Mini here, which is the network upgrade module we will be installing in the back of the NAS. So while we're back here, let's just go ahead and install that anyways. We'll open up the network card box. Now what this is going to give us is faster read and write speeds over ethernet. Now this is only going to make sense if you have a fast enough network. So on my network, I I am going to have to reconfigure a few things just to make sure that I am getting good read and write speeds. Now, in order to get the 10 gigabit speeds that this port will allow for, I'm going to have to change some configuration to my network. I'm using a mesh network in my office, and that means that the items in my main part of my office are connected to one of the mesh network hubs, and then that wirelessly communicates with another mesh network hub somewhere else in my office. So I'm only gonna get the max transfer speeds that those mesh network hubs can achieve when connected to each other. If you want the fastest transfer speeds between your devices, you're going to need to use ethernet cable and connect them through something like a switch. Now on the bottom of the device, we also have ports for NVMe SSDs. These can be used for caching, and the purpose for using SSD cache is to to improve the performance. Yes, we're gonna be putting in spinning hard drives, which are a lot slower, but what the Synology NAS is able to do is use the SSD cache to hold some of the files. If you're transferring things back and forth, it definitely improves the read and write speeds. So if I was going to be using this device on my desktop, like I am with that two bay NAS, I would put some SSD cache in. My two bay NAS has SSD cache and it definitely improves read and write speeds when transferring lots of files. All right, let's install these drives. You're gonna need your Synology key just to unlock all of these doors. These have locks on them just so that you can't accidentally eject one of these. And so you just rotate all of these with the little key and then lift up on all of these to eject them and then you can slide them out. So we'll go ahead and slide each one of these out so that we could put a drive in them. It's very easy to install the drives. Before we do that, I will show you that this can be expanded as far as the RAM memory goes as well. 
This is technically a computer with a processor and it has RAM and storage needs of its own, just like any other device. And so you can expand the RAM. So if you were gonna be using this more as a server and you're gonna be hosting things from it, such as a website, or you're gonna use it for security cameras and stuff like that, you definitely might want to consider putting a little bit of additional RAM in this so that it has more to work with. Once you have a drive installed in the Caddy, you just simply slide it in finding the slot and push the latch down. With all the hard drives installed, we're ready to connect the power, connect the ethernet cable to my network and begin the setup process. With power and ethernet connected, let's go ahead and power it on. Now, when you hear the confirming beep noise, it means that it's ready to be findable on your network. You start that process by opening up a web browser on your local network and type in find.synology.com. The website is actually going to search your network for Synology devices. It will show any existing Synology devices that you have on your network and your new Synology device should show up as well. Now, if the Synology tool through the web browser does not find your NAS, you may need to install the Synology Assistant. That is what I had to do this time. And as you can see, I have my three Synology NAS devices showing up here and I can click connect to connect to one of them. I'll go ahead and accept the EULA, hit OK. And now I'm going to be able to connect to the NAS. And now you can see I have the welcome screen for the DS923+. Plus. I'll just simply go through the setup here continue and Synology is going to install the disk station manager on the device. And this shouldn't take a whole lot of time, probably three or four minutes and it'll be installed and then we'll continue the setup process. All right, now that we're presented with the welcome screen, we can hit start and give our device a name. So I'm going to call this JH Backup for Jared Hill Backup. We'll go ahead and put in my name for the administrator account. And then we want to create a password for this. So I use one password for all of my password storage. And so we are going to generate a password. We'll hit new item, login, call this JH Backup NAS. And then I will paste this password in place, allow it to automatically install updates. And then it's asking if I want to connect to my Synology account, which I do. And then you want to set up a Quick Connect ID. What a Quick Connect ID does is allows you to easily access your NAS remotely. So when you're on your local area network, your NAS has an IP address and that's a local IP address. So when you're outside of your network, perhaps at a coffee shop, at home, another office or something like that, you want to connect to your NAS, the Quick ID allows for easy access to that NAS that's on your local network. So I'm gonna go ahead and call this one Jared Hill BU for backup right now. I'll probably change that later and hit submit. It gives me my Quick Connect ID. So the URL that I would use, I definitely wanna save that. Maybe save it as a bookmark in your browser. I'll hit okay. We'll hit submit. All right, now we're presented with the login screen. You can see we're at JH Backup and I simply need to get my username and password that we had originally set up. And so we'll go to the correct NAS and grab the password for that. I'll type in the username and then I'll paste in the password and we will be on the DSM screen. Awesome. We are presented with the ability to install Synology Drive Server, Synology Office and Synology Photos. Synology Drive Server is kind of like Dropbox or Google Drive for your NAS. And so if you're setting up a scenario like I am where this is going to be a backup of another NAS, I probably wouldn't want to install that because I have Synology Drive Server running on my other NAS. But if this is your main NAS, you might want to install this and then install the Synology Drive app on your Mac or your PC so that you can easily sync files between a Mac and a PC and the NAS just as you would something like Dropbox or Google Drive. So I'm going to go ahead and say no thanks for this right now. Uh, it also prompts me for an extended warranty. I'll hit dismiss for now. And then it offers two-factor authentication, which I'm going to choose remind me later, but I highly recommend setting this up as it protects the login of your NAS against people from 
brute forcing your password and being able to get into your NAS. Now we need to create a storage pool and volume. We'll go ahead and hit create now. Essentially what that's going to do is it's gonna take the drives that we have in here and create a usable pool of storage from those drives. So let's hit start. We're gonna choose the SHR RAID type because I want one drive fault tolerance, which means if one of these drives goes bad, I could pull it out and put in another drive and not experience any data loss. This being the backup, I definitely want that. So we'll hit next. We'll choose all of our drives and hit next. It tells us that we're gonna get about 10.9 terabytes of capacity. These are four terabyte drives. And so four times four, we should be getting 16, but because we have one fault tolerant drive, we're not getting that full 16 and that's okay. That's the way that it all works. So we'll just go ahead and hit max for the modified allocated size because we want the maximum amount of storage space on this one volume. You can create multiple volumes, which essentially is like having multiple external hard drives as part of your NAS. And I did do this with the one that's mounted on my desk. The NAS that's mounted on my desk has five terabytes of allocated storage for time machine backup and the rest of that is allocated as external storage. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit next. I'm gonna hit next again, and I don't need this encrypted. We're fine, I'll hit apply, I'll hit okay. And now it's gonna go ahead and format these drives and create that storage pool out of the four drives that are inside the NAS. All right, as you can see, we have our storage pool and it's optimizing in the background. That means it's kind of going through the drives and configuring them and spreading data across all of them so that everything is optimized for moving forward. This will take a little bit of time. You can see here that it probably has about 18 hours left of time, but that doesn't mean that we can't do anything with our NAS. We could definitely use our NAS right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that window. Now, in order to get my desktop NAS to back up to this NAS, we're going to need to install Hyper Backup on the desktop NAS. So I've switched over to that NAS and we're gonna go into the package center and search for Hyper Backup. And so I'll just type in Hyper and you can see we've got Hyper Backup right here. And I'll hit open on Hyper Backup and it says select a backup type folders and packages, entire system. I'm fine with folders and packages. I don't need the entire system backed up. So now we're going to choose the backup destination, a Synology C2 storage, remote NAS device, or a local shared folder or USB. And then we can also back up to cloud storage devices as well, such as Dropbox. I'm gonna choose remote NAS device and hit next. Now I have to choose the IP address, but I can also choose the drop down here and it will search my network. And so we'll try that first. You can see that it pulled up the other NAS devices that I have on my network. So I'm gonna choose JH backup. We'll turn on transfer encryption. We'll leave that turned on. Certificate authentication, we'll go ahead and hit trust. And now we're ready to install Hyper Backup on the other device. So we're gonna switch back over to that one. We'll type in Hyper and get Hyper Backup and we'll choose Hyper Backup Vault by hitting install and it's gonna download and install that package on this NAS. So we need Hyper Backup on our source NAS and we need Hyper Backup Vault on our backup NAS. So now let's switch back over to my main NAS and we're gonna go ahead and hit login and we'll hit password login. We'll put in the username and password for the backup NAS and we have a login. Now we need to choose a folder. We don't have any folders available. So we're gonna go back over to the backup NAS and create a shared folder here. So we'll call this JH NAS backup and I'll hit next, next, next. We'll just go through all of this really quick so that we can create the folder and have it ready to go. Now you can see we have the JH NAS backup folder right there. We're backing up and we'll go ahead and hit next. What do we wanna back up? On my desktop NAS, I have two volumes. Volume one is essentially my extended data. So that's video projects, stuff like that that I'm working on. And then volume two is my time machine backup. And I probably want the time machine backup as well because if something happens to the NAS that's sitting next to my MacBook Pro, then I, I probably wanna be able to restore to that time machine backup. So we'll go ahead and choose both of these and then we'll hit next. Now here's the list of applications that are running on that NAS and I can back up the data to those as well. But since I'm backing up all of the files anyways, I don't necessarily need to do this. And all these really do is back up settings anyways, so I don't really need that 
because since I'm logged into my Synology account, those settings are backed up anyways. And if I was going to set up a new NAS, I can restore settings such as settings to applications pretty easily. So I'm not really going to bother with that. Here's where I would set the time in which I want the backup to take place. I might want that to take place overnight while I'm sleeping. So that way the transfer of all of that data doesn't end up slowing down my network as I'm trying to work on projects and stuff like that. So I'll probably set this to say one o'clock AM. It can run backups at that time and then it can check the backups at 5 AM. And so we'll just go ahead and hit next. Here's how you would set up the backup rotation. It's obviously only going to back up as much as it can and store here. And so since that device actually has more storage than this has right now, I'm not necessarily going to be able to get a full backup, which is why I might decide to actually remove the time machine backup from that setup because the 16 terabytes that's in the NAS that's on my desk, I need to exceed that amount of storage on my backup NAS. And so it might make sense actually for me to go and disable the time machine volume right now so that I'm not backing up all of that data that uh, is not going to fit on this device in the first place. So we'll just go ahead and hit next and hit done. And it's going to go ahead and save my settings. And then my backup NAS should be configured and ready to go. So every night at about one in the morning, it's going to start. And I could start that backup process right now but I'm gonna go ahead and choose no and let that take place at 1 a.m. when it is scheduled. You can see here next scheduled backup time is 7.13 at 1 a.m. and it's gonna give me information about that backup. Now I don't need to do anything else with this NAS. I can literally power it off and disconnect it and go put it where I want it to be, reconnect everything, turn the power back on, and it's gonna to connect to my network and then of course the hyper backup and hyper vault software are going to talk to each other and reconnect and then run those backups every night at 1 a.m. And so that's going to give me the peace of mind that I need to make sure that everything that's on my desk is configured and backed up. Now I could also do this remotely. I don't have to have this device set up here. I could have put this device at a family member's house or at a remote location and I could be backing up all of that data offsite. What I probably would want to do is do my first initial backup at my office so that the big data load transfer of moving everything over for the very first time would be done quickly on my local network. Then I could power down this device, I could take it to a new location, and then just go through the configurator again to reconfigure and reconnect the NAS to the correct IP address because obviously it would have to connect to an IP address over the internet and that's gonna be a different configuration process. But it definitely is still easy to do and walks you through the process pretty easily. You just have to know the IP addresses and it's, it's probably a best practice to have a static IP address at both locations so that your IP address doesn't change from time to time as most residential and basic internet connections do. So what do you think? That was quite a process, but it didn't really take long for us to set up a backup of my NAS. Now I know that my data is gonna be safe and secure. And as I make changes to the main NAS that's connected to my computer, all of those changes will be backed up nightly to a remote NAS and I won't have to worry about any data loss or any issues there. I've got links in the description to this equipment so you could check it out, see pricing and all of that good stuff. If you have any questions, definitely ask down in the comment section below. I appreciate you sticking all the way through. If you did, give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you back in another one soon. Take care.